Hello, in this video, we'll be going over the first week of development, specifically ovulation to implantation. Before I get into that, I wanted to first talk about the sexual cycles that occur in an adult female. What I have drawn here is the uterus, and then the uterine tube and the ovary right here. Um, specifically looking at the uterus itself, there are three different layers. The innermost layer is called the endometrium, and then here would be the myometrium, this is that muscular portion of the uterus, and then finally the outermost layer of the uterus is the perimetrium. We're specifically going to focus on the endometrium. During Throughout the, um, at puberty, the female begins to undergo regular monthly cycles and the endometrium will begin to thicken. And as the endometrium grows and becomes thicker, this, uh, the tissue becomes more vasculature, vascular and it creates a nutrient rich environment that is suitable for embryo implantation. However, if implantation does not occur, then the endometrium is shed during menstruation and that is what occurs when a woman is on her period, is that endometrial lining is being shed because no implantation has occurred. So now that we kind of understand the nature of the uterus and the sexual cycles that occur in an adult female, we'll now move into the beginning of the development of the oocyte, specifically at ovulation. So at the beginning of each ovarian cycle, 15 to 20 primary stage follicles are going to be released. And I've drawn that follicle out here in orange and then in purple is the primary oocyte. Out of those 15 to 20 primary stage follicles, only one of them is going to mature. And what that mature follicle looks like I will label that here. In yellow is the called what's called the corona radiata. In red is the zona pellucida. And then in purple is the actual oocyte. The function of the corona radiata and the zona pellucida is to protect and nourish the oocyte, and it also serves a function in assisting in fertilization, which we will go into more detail a little bit later. So we've got our mature follicle. It is ready to ovulate the egg. At this point, the follicle will release the egg into the peritoneal cavity into the peritoneal cavity right here let me draw that out right here it's the corona radiata the zona pellucida and the oocyte right here it is now within the peritoneal cavity what's left behind of a portion of the follicle is what is called the corpus luteum and the function of the corpus luteum is to, oop, what it'll do is secrete progesterone. Oh, progesterone and estrogen. And what this will do is it'll tell the endometrium to not undergo menstruation to not shed that thickened endometrial lining and to prepare for implantation because the egg is on its way and hopefully it will get fertilized. So right now we have left off. Our egg is in the peritoneal cavity. The first structure that it will encounter are fimbriae located on the uterine tube. So it will be these finger-like projections coming off of the uterine tube. Here's that uterine tube. And that connects into the uterus, the uterine cavity itself. So our little oocyte here 
in the peritoneal cavity. It will be picked up by these fimbriae and brought here into the infundibulum. And within the uterine tube itself are tiny hair-like projections called cilia. These will beat and they will push the oocyte, kind of like uh, making a river current. They'll push that oocyte into the ampulla. Here's that ampulla part of the uterine tube. Now I'll redraw that oocyte right here. There's the corona radiata, the zona pellucida, and then our oocyte right there. And it is here that it will patiently wait 12 to 24 hours for sperm to make their way for fertilization. For what fertilization is, it is the process by which the male and female gametes fuse. But for that to occur, for fertilization to occur, the sperm must undergo a conditioning period. This conditioning period is called capacitation. And this occurs within the female genital tract. For the sperm to be able to fertilize the egg, they must penetrate the corona radiata, the zona pellucida, in order to then fuse with the oocyte membrane. So what occurs in capacitation is the glycoprotein coat and some of the proteins are removed from the plasma membrane that overlie the acrosomal region of the sperm. So I'll illustrate the acros acrosomal region here in green. And then capacitation essentially allows the sperm to penetrate the corona radiata. And I'll illustrate that here. All of these sperm have been able to undergo capacitation and they have successfully penetrated the corona radiata. The second thing that must occur for fertilization to occur is penetration of the zona pellucida. So here's our zona pellucida in red. Um, what occurs is once a sperm penetrates the zona pellucida, so we got our, our sperm here, it has successfully penetrated the zona pellucida, and now the plasma membrane of the sperm can now come in contact with the plasma membrane of the oocyte. Once this occurs, the oocyte then releases enzymes that alters the properties of the zona pellucida. And what happens is this prevents any other sperm from being able to penetrate the zona pellucida. And essentially, this prevents polyspermy. So only one sperm is allowed to penetrate the zona pellucida. The oocyte will prevent, will bar entry to all other sperm. Once fusion of the sperm and ova membranes occur, the male and female pronuclei then break down and fuse, and this forms a zygote. Now, let me draw that zygote here. So the zona, we've got our zona pellucida, and then here is our zygote. And is kind of that first stage of human life. This is our developing embryo right here. The zygote then undergoes a series of mitotic divisions. There's our zona pellucida again. So it's dividing. It'll divide again. Now there are four cells. These series of divisions, also called cleavage, result in the formation of blastocysts, no, blastomeres. So got two blastomeres here and then four blastomeres here. As these blastomeres increase in number, the actual size of the 
cell itself of the zygote does not change. So as you can imagine, as more and more cells are added into the this structure, they're going to become more and more compact. And just about the time at about the when there's about 16 blastomeres and just as it's about to enter into the uterine cavity here it is now called a morula and this is at about day four This is at day four. It's also around this time, because this ball is getting more and more compact, that we start to distinguish between the outer cell mass. It'll literally be called outer cell mass. Outer cell mass, and then on the inside of this compact morula is called the inner cell mass. At about day five, day five, the inner cell mass outer cell mass will have new names. The outer cell mass will be called the trophoblast. The inner cell mass will then be called the embryoblast. And this is what will form the embryo proper. This space here fills up with fluid and that is now called a blastocele, which gives it its new name, a blastocyst. So on day five, it is now called a blastocyst. It's no longer a morula. Now, in order to prepare for implantation, the zona pellucida must break down. The zona pellucida prevents implantation of the embryo. So at around day five, day six, the zona pellucida begins to break down. And this process is what allows for implantation of the blastocyst onto the inner lining or the endometrium of the uterus. So this is about day six. Green is our trophoblast. And the trophoblast begins to burrow into the endometrium. Some enzymes that are released and the trophoblast burrows into the endometrium. And <clears throat> also on the sixth day, there's going to be the beginning of the formation of the bilaminar disc. The embryoblast proper is going to have epiblast and hypoblast cells scattered throughout it. But about around the time of implantation, those cells begin to polarize. So the epi first of all, the epiblast is going to be located on this side of the blastocyst, the side closest to the endometrium. And as differentiation of the embryoblast occurs, you have the epiblast form. So this is the epiblast and the hypoblast. And this forms that bilaminar disc. Right around the day six, day seven, and kind of poking into the second week. 
Let's see if I wanted to say any more regarding this. The Blasto Seal is also going to have a new name. This will become the Primitive Yolk Sack. The Trophoblast itself will eventually develop into the Placenta. The Embryoblast develops Dorsal Ventral Polarity. And I think that was all I wanted to cover in that first week with ovulation to implantation. So I will zoom out here, just kind of get a big picture of what we have looked at. Um, just a quick summary might be helpful. So we have here a little oocyte, it's maturing. It is then released from the ovary into the peritoneal cavity. And the corpus luteum then indicates to the endometrium to not shed. We got an oocyte on the way. The oocyte then enters into the uterine tube. And it will patiently wait in the ampulla for the arrival of sperm and for fertilization to occur. For that to occur, there are three phases that must occur. First of all, capacitation, and which allows for the penetration of the corona radiata, then penetration of the zona pellucida, and then finally, the fusion of the oocyte and sperm cell membranes. From there, we now have what is called a zygote. They should have wrote that down there. The zygote will then divide and then it will become, on day four, it will become a morula as it's entering into the uterine cavity. And then on, ooh, I think I said day five, but day four, it's a morula. On day five, it will become a blastocyst. And then finally on day six, it will then implant onto the endometrial lining. I hope this video helped and enjoy studying.